Thank you very much. Well, to follow on from the previous speaker, that's quite something. What I'm going to be talking about is seeing history repeating itself, because I'm going to talk about what happened 80 years ago, when another ruthless dictator caused havoc, chaos, and absolute pandemonium in Europe, like the present one is doing in, in Ukraine. And all, this happen, all that happens is that it brings more war, more killing, and worst of all, more hatred. And hatred is completely destructive. My name is Stephen Frank, and I was born in 1935 in the middle, uh, in the middle of three sons. My mother, born in Eastbourne, had come to Amsterdam as an 18-year-old to study there where she met my father, an up-and-coming respected lawyer. He was in great demand, and with the rise of Hitler in Germany, he headed a government-funded welfare organization which helped German Jews to settle in what was then neutral Netherlands. Life was happy, secure, and we lived in a nice house in the then new southern district of Amsterdam. Then the Germans arrived in May 1940. And suddenly, I became aware that I was different from the other children in the street. Living in a secular family, I was not really aware of being Jewish. But then I was banned from playing in the park with my friends. A notice appeared on the gate for Joden, for Boden, for Jews forbidden. Then I was taken away from my lovely primary school, the first of its kind in Europe that looked like what today's primary schools look like and placed into an old Jewish school, where I'd see my classmates suddenly disappear. Furthermore, I was banned from the zoo, from public transport, and many other public places. Street benches were displaying notices forbidding Jews to sit there. I had to wear a star to show that I was different and inferior, a form of mockery of the Jewish faith with its mocking lettering of perverted Hebrew, written the wrong way round, by the way. With the occupation, my father joined the Dutch resistance and helped Jews to obtain false papers, which got them through Belgium and France and over the Alps into the safety of neutral Switzerland. He also helped Jews to find safe houses in Holland, and we even hid Jews in our own house from time to time. Jews hiding Jews was a very, very unusual occasion. One day, in October 1942, my father left early in the morning to walk to work, kissed us all goodbye, and I never saw him again. He had been betrayed and was arrested in his office in the center of Amsterdam and taken to the SS headquarters there and then onto the notorious prison of Amersfoort. There he was beaten and tortured and later sent to the big transit camp, Vesterborg and soon after that to Auschwitz, where my father was murdered in the gas chambers on the 21st of January 1943, aged only 39. He had done so many really good things for his fellow human beings during his short life. Whilst he was in prison, my mother saw him briefly by disguising herself as a man and changing places with one of the cleaners. He told her that he had been tortured but he had given nothing away. Three of my father's friends, not Jewish, Ernst Heldering, Jan Wiersma, and Arnold Dai, who incidentally became the burgomaster, the mayor of Amsterdam, soon after the war, petitioned the Nazi authorities for clemency, citing a long letter of all the organizations with my father had been involved with. This was a very dangerous thing to do. They all had families and responsibilities. The Nazis would not relent as far as my father was concerned, but they did eventually allow his wife and three sons to be placed on one of these few priority lists that the Germans had set up in Holland to stop mass panic among the Jewish population. None of these promises were in fact kept, but it surprisingly kept our li uh, saved our lives as we were placed on the Bernefeld list, which contained the upper echelons of Dutch Jewish society with a promise that we would not be sent to work a to a camp abroad. 
In March 1943, we were ordered out of our home and reported to the station and sent to Barnefeld. Barnefeld had a castle. Lost my place which the Germans had requisitioned. And in the end, there were about 660 people in our group. There was no barbed wire, no guards. It was pure fear that kept you there. After all, we were promised not to be transported east. Stay put, keep your head down, and hopefully the war would soon be over and we'd be able to go back to our homes. After six months, the German army entered the camp and we were given 20 minutes to pack our belongings, and we were put on the train for Westerberg. This put the fear of God into many, as this was the main transit camp for transfer to the unknown destination of the East. Uh, Westerberg camp, located in mid-eastern Holland, was enclosed by a moat and two-meter-high barbed wire fences with watchtowers on stilts, and guards with machine guns and searchlights looking down on you. There were about 15,000 inmates there at any one time. The hygienic conditions were appalling. Lice were everywhere, also dysentery, scarlet fever, polio, and hepatitis. But we did not starve in this camp. It was here that I learned how to become self-sufficient and streetwise. On one occasion, I had wandered off. My mind was on other things and I found that I had wandered across no man's land and had wandered to the perimeter wire. Here I was set upon by an Alsatian dog by, unleashed by two guards patrolling the wire. I was bitten all over, and I can still hear the guards laughing at this bit of Jew baiting. A little eight-year-old was being mauled by this dog. Then they called it off, and I ran back to the barrack, bleeding from all these bite marks. But I had learnt my lesson. Transports would leave Westerbork every Tuesday for the East, organized by Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi arch-bureaucrat. They were clearly labeled, mostly cattle trucks going to Auschwitz and Sobibor, both in Poland. If you were lucky, you went to Bergen-Belsen in Germany, or occasionally to Theresienstadt near Prague. We were there for a year, an unusually long period, and now with the Allies at Arnhem in the south, we were transported in September 1944 to Theresienstadt. This was a journey I shall never forget. 39 hours in a crammed cattle truck, no food, no water, no sleep. But what I remember most was the stench that built up of human sweat, of vomit, of urine, of feces, and the gradual depletion of oxygen. Mum was gasping for air. Then the train stopped. It was dark outside. There was a rumble as the door was slid open. And I remember this waft of ice-cool air which invaded the cattle truck. And suddenly, I could eat properly again. <sighs> Theresienstadt was a garrison town built in 1780 to house 8,000 soldiers and their families. When the Germans invaded the country, they threw them all out and crammed 44,000 Jews in the same space. In this place, we starved, and that feeling of hunger and the pain associated with it is something that I shall never forget. Typhus, the typhus epidemic had started. My mother volunteered to work in the camp hospital laundry a place seething with harmful bacteria and disease, but where she had access to hot water, the only place in the camp. Here she would wash her children's clothes out of sight of the authorities to keep typhus at bay and, and also adults' clothes, which she bartered for food in order to feed her children. Tens of thousands of my people died from typhus. Soon we children were separated from my mother into a children's home, where we just invented games to play. Somehow we made a pack of 52 cards, made torches from bulbs, wire, and exhausted batteries, which the guards had thrown away. If you put the exhausted batteries between your thighs at night when you went to sleep, your body warmth would regenerate them sufficiently so to light your little torch bulb briefly when it got dark again. And it shone like a bright star in the sky, 
so comforting as you imagine life back in Amsterdam before the war. Disease and starvation killed so many of us there. But also in this another but also this was another transit camp. You were waiting your turn to be gassed in the killing fields of the East. I recall the selection of children in our children's home. The guards weren't interested in me. They deliberately split up siblings, one to stay behind, one to go east. It was all the children had left. Other members of their families had long gone. The screaming and the wailing during selection is still vivid in my memory. In January 1945, as the Allies were closing in, we had open cattle trucks with mainly corpses returning from Auschwitz. The few survivors told us about the gas chambers. We heard and saw the bombing of Dresden and the rumour started, we're going to be liberated and they are building the gas chambers here. Joy and fear all in one go. I recall being woken up very early one morning, made to get dressed and taken to a dimly lit tunnel at the crematorium. Here we lined up, and soon a box was passed to me by a little girl on my right, which I passed on to the little girl on my left, and so on down the line. For hours, each box contained the ashes of the dead. And in true German efficiency, each box was labelled with the name of the person whose ashes it contained, their date and place of birth and death. And every now and then, I would hear either upstream or downstream a quiet sobbing as a child held, held the ashes of their mother or father or family and soon they were being thrown into the river to remove the evidence before we were liberated. Later, early one evening, my mother was returning from the laundry when she was approached by some Russian prisoners of war and persuaded to enter their house and was taken into the loft where they had hidden a radio. They gave her pencil and paper. And she saw, she heard Winston Churchill broadcast from the cabinet war rooms in London that the war would end at midnight. She was probably the first person in the camp to know that the war would be over. But what was going to happen to us in the intervening time? Were we going to be gassed or shot? And there was even a rumour that the whole camp was to be do destroyed with dynamite. People went to sleep fearful. But the following morning, the Germans had disappeared and the Soviet army had arrived to liberate the camp. They left straight away, fearing infection from the typhus epidemic. The Red Cross took over, and for about a month, nobody left the camp whilst they started a decontamination and feeding program. The Dutch group was split into three. At the beginning of June, we left with the second group. My mother pleaded with the Red Cross to be sent to England, where her father was, fearing most in Holland would be dead. I then embarked upon a journey which took us to a castle in Falkenau, Sokolov in Czech, near the German border, and seizing an opportunity by the Red Cross to get to England, we travelled to Pilsen, which was under American control, where I witnessed a displaced persons camp and a sight that I shall never forget of utter human misery. With great determination, my mother got the cooperation of the American garrison commander to help us on a flight piloted by two wonderful RAF pilots of Transport Command who flew us purely humanely and illegally to Paris, and then on to Croydon Airport, sitting on the floor of an empty cargo plane. There we stood, on the runway. Our plane had taxied away and disappeared into the air. When another aeroplane landed, it carried Brits who were caught in Europe when war was declared in 1939 and were subsequently interned and were now returning home. So we just joined them. We were taken by coach across badly bombed London to the RAF reception centre at Stanmore. It was there that my mother was interviewed by the authorities before she could contact her father in London. Whilst there, as with so many government establishments, there's always a policeman on duty. 
He took pity on these three undernourished, scruffy little boys and taught us our first English. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then gave us each sixpence, a pound in today's money. It was the first act of kindness shown by a policeman in uniform I had witnessed in five years. We were home. And it is here that I feel safe. I lost many members of my family, but as I speak, I think of my darling grandmother, who gave pleasure to so many as a violinist in England and was one of the first to be deported from Holland to Auschwitz in 1942. And finally, to my wonderful parents, role models as if ever there were one. I now had to start again. New country, new language, new home, and new challenges and opportunities. I, with many other survivors, go into schools to talk to young people and tell them of what we witnessed when Europe went mad. The effect on them is remarkable. As well as the schools, I speak at the Lessons from Auschwitz program organized by the Holocaust Education Trust, whereby two sixth formers from every state school have the opportunity to visit Auschwitz, when permitted again, where death still lurks decades later, and learn from the experience, all financed by the government. As a living witness, I play my part, and it is my duty. In the words attributed to Edmund Burke, famous philosopher, and a respected member of parliament for Bristol. The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Thank you for listening.